All I could say, my only advantage is that I've suffered so much. I've had so much death, so much disease, so much addiction that I was surrounded to. And I said, no, 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 no. I put up the barriers and I said, you are not getting me. This is an emergency broadcast. This is not a test. Welcome everybody to the Dad's Doomsday Guide. Today we're pleased to have on Doug Evans. Doug is an early pioneer in the natural food industry. In 2002, he co-founded Organic Avenue, one of the first exclusively plant-based retail chains in the country. He then created and founded Juicero, the first fresh farm-to-glass automatic cold-pressed juicer. Doug is the author of The Sprout Book, which includes 40 recipes that feature sprouts on a variety of foods for the healthiest diet possible, along with informative interviews with leaders in functional medicine and nutrition. And you can pick that up on Amazon, which is where I got it from. Welcome, Doug. Thanks for coming on. Hey, my pleasure. I also want to put out there, support your local bookseller. So yes. if you go to any local bookseller, tell them you want the Sprout book. They'll order it for you. You'll get it in a couple of days. So I watched a couple of videos of you to kind of familiarize myself with you. And um, I kind of had a similar feeling because I had some health issues in the past and it kind of made me change my diet. But I've... I've struggled to stay with that. How did you, and did you come from kind of a more unhealthy way of eating to now? What was that process like? Was it a struggle for you? Was it a health issue? What actually was the catalyst to turn you over to like, I'm going to eat healthy now? I, I mean, once you realize that you have your will, the, the, the innate will that says, I am Doug. I am a loving guy. I'm a, I want to be healthy. I want to live a good life. I want to, you know, do all these things, right? So we have that voice, right? And then we have the voice inside. And some people hear the voice. Some people don't hear the voice. But that voice is lazy and destructive, right? That's the voice that says, oh, let me go eat that haagen -Dazs and eat the whole pint of the <laughs> Ben Jerry Chunky Monkey. Yeah. And once I became aware that there was the enemy inside, like that I could be my greatest champion or I could be my enemy inside, that, that I needed to take control of that little voice and put it into check. And so... You know, one of the things that I realized is that being present is really powerful. Like that's a tool that enables me to make thoughtful decisions. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, I love to eat, right? I love to eat. And I grew up without a lot of food, right? And seconds were rare. And food was sparse when I grew up. So as soon as I started to make money or have access to food, like when I was in the military and there was like free food, didn't matter that it tasted like crap, there was free food, I would go back and get seconds and thirds and eat myself into a borderline food coma, <laughs> right? Yeah. But then I realized the next day when I had to be up at five o'clock in the morning that running our 5K, 10K, 15K, 20K was much harder. The heavier I weighed, the, the poor night's sleep that I got, I made some decisions even back then. I, I haven't even thought about this in 30 years, mm -hmm. but I made some decisions back then um, when I was 17. Okay, I'm not going to eat too much. Like, I'm only going to eat what I need. Like, the I, the the that I live in abundance. There's an abundance of food here. Like, I don't have to worry where my next meal is. Mm -hmm. And that's the psychology of food engineering. It's okay. that they understand the way we were designed to eat is that we never knew where our next meal was coming from. So if you don't know where your next meal is coming from, therefore, when you see food, you eat until you can't eat anymore. And theoretically, you're storing that fat for that rainy day. Mm -hmm. But most of the people who are listening to this podcast, that rainy day never comes. That rainy day never comes because tomorrow just comes another 
smorgasbord, another buffet, another drive through, another like, you know, latte, muffin, burger, pizza, pasta, you know, fried chicken, all that stuff. So we never get that scarcity when it comes to food mm-hmm. in, in our in our world. Right. Around the world. 10,000 people are dying of starvation every day. 25 million people a year die of starvation, right? But here, we're dying of diabetes, obesity, heart disease, cancer, predominantly attributed to lifestyle. Mm-hmm. So so you ask me, how do I keep this up? I put up like barricades, erosion control, you know, dams, Whatever I can intellectually do with my present mind that wants to live, that wants to be healthy, that wants to be a good parent, with that mind, so that I can hit the target more often. So in my mind, cooked food, processed food, refined food, meat, dairy, animal products, fast food, beer, wine, soda, sugary carbonated beverages, all of that stuff to me are vices. Like they may as well be crack cocaine, right? Street prostitutes, you know, or like just, um, you know, fentanyl. Like they're bad stuff in my mind. Mm -hmm. I'm not telling you they're bad. I'm saying for me. Mm -hmm. So so if if I know all that and I think of those things as, deadly for me, then what do I eat? I eat an abundance of fruits, vegetables, seeds, nuts, seaweeds, algae, and sprouts. And okay. those things I a- eat without added salt, without added oil, without added sugar. And you find out that you give someone a head of organic raw broccoli, they're going to eat a few bites. The nutrients will go to the brain. And then the, the body will say, time out. Okay, I, I'm done. I've had enough. Mm-hmm. Right? You take that same organic broccoli and you saute it with butter or oil and salt that same person who took three bites or one bite of the organic broccoli would eat two pounds Mm -hmm. of that because the broccoli becomes the carrier for salt, oil, and sugar, which just triggers the pleasure sensors in the brain. Mm -hmm. So now that I know that, right, I unpacked it. I've, I've had that feeling of nausea, of fullness, of lethargy, of sleepless nights because of dying. Now I say, aha, I'm going to eat between noon and 7 p.m. And I'm going to eat predominantly fruit and sprouts. And if I do that and I stay on that path, then life is simple. What do you think separates you from the most, I think, people, most Americans at least, and I would say it's probably uniform to everybody because like you said, it's evolved and they engineer it to kind of hook those addictions. But what separates you from someone who can't keep that up? Like there's tons of people who diet, who eat healthy, who always go back, go constantly going back to the other stuff. And whereas someone like you has this willpower to either set up the, you know, the barriers to keep you straight and narrow, but what if you could like identify something where someone listening could be like, oh, maybe I need to look at that. Or do you think it's completely individualistic? No, no. I, well, I had firsthand um, knowledge and visualizations of the impact of those foods, right? The first one was watching my aunt get adult onset diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and having them chop off her feet below mm. her ankles. And visualizing being this close to my aunt, right? And then seeing she will never walk normally again and seeing the fat going over the the prosthetics and seeing her in the wheelchair and seeing the rolls of fat and seeing her aging and, and just looking, like this is a woman that I loved, looking 
like death, like moving around like death. And ultimately she died, right? And then my uncle was the mirror image of her and he died. And then my mother developed stomach cancer and she died. And then my father developed heart disease and he died. And then my brother, two years older than me, became obese, became diabetic, had the first of three strokes and a heart attack. And then I'm seeing like, wow, if I don't make radical changes, like I'm going to be just like them. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't even fathom. I mean, take a moment, Scott, and imagine what it would be like not to have your feet. Yeah. It's, I mean, Jesus. Imagine, you know, you look like, how tall are you, Scott? About 6'3". You're 6'3". So you're about 175, 180? Uh, it's like 200. <laughs> 200. Okay. So imagine you're 400 pounds. Yeah. Imagine you're double the weight. Imagine the effort, the energy that you go through. And I realize I'm like, I have so much compassion for people that are overweight because I don't think it's their choice. Like, I think what's happening is they are brainwashed and they are marketed to, you know, from all these societal factors, right? You know, from uh, culture eating processed food to family eating processed food to massive amounts of world class brain engineering brainwashing like these these companies market they know how to market to your brain can i i, I want to like address that one because i know you, you just said it earlier and then i've heard that before like how does that work i mean do you have any insight into like people in a lab or are they doing addiction tests on people like how are they tapping into that evolutionary need for like sugars and fats that you'd find in nature i mean how far are these companies taking that they're they're taking it to the to the furthest point of financial effectiveness. So there's like, if you think about like cheese puffs, mm. they reach the bliss point, right? Like they're light, they're fluffy, they're colored, they're sticky, they're cheesy. They've got the fat, they've got the sugar, they've got the salt. Like you give someone a cheese puff and they don't have a gross aversion to it, they will eat it. They'll lick their fingers. They'll, you know, they'll, they'll pull them that's, out. That's of me. <laughs> yeah. They, they pull them out of someone else's ass. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so these companies have massive armies of food scientists, food engineering, and, and they work on both fronts. They work on the physical front of engineering the food so that it looks good. It tastes good. It's highly addictive. And it's even in their advertising. They, they know it. They go, Lay's potato chips. You can't just eat one or whatever, Pringles, because they know, like you just can't. And when you open up that Pandora's box, that's why, you know, if you think about what they say in AA, right? They say all of the alcohol in the world will never be enough. But any alcohol is too much, right? Yeah. So, so when you think about the food, so that's one level. Like the food is engineered, like to just overeat. Like you're, you're, it's designed to eat the portions, the 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 flavoring, the color, etc. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the other engineers, the data scientists, the marketers, like when when a big company launches a brand they may spend infinite amount of dollars doing multivariant testing across audiences of all ages, all socioeconomic markets, all financial markets, demographic, psychographic, and test everything to see, oh, what message is going to cause the person to drive off? They will literally have people, you know, in using a lap counter, looking at a billboard, sitting on the side of the road and seeing how many people turn off the road, you know, to that thing and go to the restaurant. Jesus. And then, then they'll just do it. 
and they know how to get statistically significant data. And now they do even more advanced things with lasers and sensors and maths. So, so there's this level. And all I could say, my only advantage is that I've suffered so much. I've had so much death, so much disease, so much addiction that I was surrounded to. And I said, no, 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 no. I put up the barriers and I said, you are not getting me. Like you are not getting me. You know, maybe you'll get somebody else, but you're not getting me. I will not fall victim to your shenanigans. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. And I would say uh, it kind of echoes, well, some of what happened with me was you know, I guess some autoimmune issues popped up. I had all these weird things happen in my early twenties. And I was like, man, I'm too young for this. And I got really scared into what they were looking for and testing for. And that really scared me to start eating healthier, but it's still, I still go back and forth. If I feel better, I might dip into something junky, you know, I go back and forth and I always played sports and was very active. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about, um, meat and I know you're vegan, correct? Correct. Yep. Depending on what you watch, you can see a lot of conf conflicting information you'll see one people, some people say it's not the meat, but it's the carbs that's typically eaten with the meat, right? It's the French fries. It's the bun with the hamburger. If you're eating like grass fed steak and you're eating a bunch of vegetables, raw, whatever else, it has some counter effects to anything kind of negative in the meat. Is there any truth to that? How do you see it? Why do you, why are you vegan? I mean, for me, I think that the cow is a very inefficient source of nutrients. Mm -hmm. And that when you you peel back the onion and see that it takes eight calories of plants to create one calorie of beef, that all of this deforestation, all of this pesticide use, all of this water use is going to create meat. And that, you know, the most conservative number, and you can do your research on your own, you're a sharp guy, Scott. The, the lowest number is probably 1,500 gallons of water to prepare one pound of beef. Wow. Right? And imagine what that water is used for. It's for growing wheat or corn or soy or watering grass. And if you think about how much grass a cow needs to eat over its lifetime before it's slaughtered and, and brought to the table. So, you know, to me, and then secondly, and you know, there's always every study you see, there's going to be a conflicting study. There's going to be point counterpoint. For me, I just look at myself. Now, I could have a voracious appetite, right? For a beautiful woman. Like I see a beautiful woman, I could stop in my tracks and go, wow, right? And I could feel different emotions, different uh, Pavlovian reflexes, etc. When I see a cow, I have no carnivorous desire to go tear into it with my bare hands and teeth and 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 eat every part of it. It's it's um, organs, it's um, private parts, it's tail, it's eyeballs, it's stomach, it's ass. I have no desire for that. I have no desire, you know, to suckle off of the teat of a cow. Like, I don't want to like put my lips there. I don't want to drink the cow milk. So I look at the cow the same way I look at a pig or a dog or a cat or a rabbit. Like these are just loving animals. Mm -hmm. But for 33 years of my life, um, I was separated from the reality of how that meat was brought to the table, right? It was just put on a bun. It was had condiments. It came in a yellow and red box, said Happy Meal. They had some Star Wars figures or Disney stuff associated with it. They then added these additives and preservatives to get you hooked on it. And, and you ate it. And now, like, I look at it, and, and again, I'm very charged for this call, right? For this Zoom, <laughs> I'm charged. But I'm also very equanimous. And I see the things, and I'm like, oh, to me, I 
am eating for sustenance. I'm not eating for pleasure. Mm. So I'm eating because I need calories, I need nutrients, I need fiber, I need phytonutrients. Like I need this stuff to live, mm-hmm. right? I, I I'm not a breatharian, right? I need to I need to eat. Mm-hmm. The the people who you're referring to are actually living for their next meal. When is that coffee break? When is you know if you think about um, that coffee break where people are spending between four dollars and eight dollars for the coffee? Yeah. Do you know who the number who the number one user of dairy is in the United States? Coffee shops. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So when they think they're drinking coffee, what are they really drinking? Fat and sugar and caffeine. Oh, yeah. yeah. How many people are going in there and just getting black coffee? Like a fraction of people. So I guess then it, would it be fair to say that it's ethical reasons along with nutritional reasons that you have moved away from meat? I mean, I I, I would hate to say it feels so arrogant. I would say intelligent reasons. Like it just makes no sense. Like the moral part of it is very clear. Like I love animals, you know, I love people, I love human animals, and I love non-human animals. So uh, I don't believe there's such a thing as humane slaughter, right? Mm. Just for me, like I, I don't do that. And then from a nutritional perspective, where are all the nutrients coming from in that meat? Plants and whatever they're eating, right? Yeah. Well, coming yeah. in from plants. Yeah. So why not just eat the plants? Is there any argument to, and I, this is all coming from just me growing up and having a very Western unhealthy diet, moving more toward health. And then, but now you see, you know, there's ketogenic diets, there's a uh, paleo diet. What, what is your performance level? Like I do a lot of active stuff. So sometimes I feel like just sapped of energy. Could I exist on a vegan diet? Right. I mean, and I'm a, I'm a fucking beast at 56 years old <laughs> right? in the desert. I run 5k, 10k a day at a hundred to 120 degrees. And like, I've all the energy in the world and I've been exclusively plant-based for 23 years. And how, if someone wanted to like build muscle, I mean, could you do that on a vegan diet? Oh, a hundred percent. Okay. A hundred percent. And, and you could do it on a vegan diet and you could do it without steroids and additives and, you know, other things. A hundred percent. That's not, that's not my, that's not my thing to be like the bodybuilder or oh, the f- for sure, yeah. performance athlete. But I have some of my best friends are that like incredible specimens, you know, in that light of plant-based. What would a diet like that look like? Cause I mean, for me, it's, I, I struggle with that a lot because I don't, it goes between like, if I eat really healthy, like I know I should be, I lo- I feel like I lose weight. And then as soon as I can, you know, start incorporating some carbs or some more fats, I'll put on the weight again. And I know there's probably a, the right way to do it in terms of diet and nutrition that I'm not getting. Um, but what does a diet look like for someone who is vegan or vegetarian or something? What do you have to eat to keep that muscle on if you're working out a lot? Well, what I would say, Scott, is I'm not a nutritionist and I'm not like a high performance athlete or bodybuilder mm-hmm. in that thing. There are every single sprout contains every amino acid for a complete protein. So if someone is working out like that, they need more protein and protein exists in a variety of plants. I would be delighted to introduce you to some plant-based nutritionists, plant-based performance. Look at a uh, Novak, mm. right? He won Wimbledon. Mm-hmm. He's plant-based, mm-hmm. right? Like what does it take? And, and as a matter of fact, the the two finalists in the men's final in the center court of Wimbledon were both plant based, mm-hmm. right? I mean, how exhilarating! Most people couldn't even pick up a; they couldn't even be ball boys, you know, on, <laughs> on the court. Nonetheless, play at that level of competition. What do you feel? What do you feel about fish? Is fish still? Is that any better? Or are you talking? Because I always heard about a lot of toxins in fish, and you can't really get away from that. F- fish is extremely toxic. Okay. Like, you know, it, it's it's fish is meat without feet, right? And and fish is extremely toxic. And and what what they're doing in order to fish, 
is basically destroying the oceans. Like watch the oh. movie Sea Spiracy. Right? Watch those two movies. Here's your watch Cow Spiracy and Sea Spiracy, and you will see a little bit what happens behind the scenes. But you know, all that aside, right? We want to talk about doomsday. We want to talk about survival. We want to talk about nutrition, right? Um, for me, when I moved into this tent, is this video or audio or both? Both. Okay. So when I moved into the desert five years ago, I thought I made a tragic error. I thought that, um, what was I going to eat? And I realized not only was I in a desert, I was in a food desert. And being in a food desert meant that I was an hour plus, hour and a half away from a health food restaurant, no vegan restaurants, no nothing organic near me. Um, the closest thing was a 7-Eleven and then a Taco Bell and then a Burger King, you know, and then some crap that they sold at gas stations. And so I was having an existential crisis thinking, how was I going to do this? Because I I never grew anything. I didn't have a green thumb. So I didn't, I, and growing a, a garden and growing vegetables can take weeks or months oh, yeah. to, to happen. And if you're in the desert, it may never happen, right? It's a whole different level of desert permaculture and what grows and, and the water, all the complexities. Oh, yeah. But then... As I'm staring at the the sky and the stars and the Milky Way, they started to twinkle for me. And then I started to see them as sprouts. And I got this concentrated, multi-hour download that sprouts weren't a garnish. They weren't a side dish. That sprouts were vegetables. And these were vegetables that I could grow without soil, without sunshine, without fertilizer. And I could do that in days, not weeks, months, or years. So that was like, you know, one pillar of the download. The next one was that sprouts were vitamins and minerals and that they contained every micronutrient, every phytonutrient, every polyphenol, every bioflavonoid. Um, every amino acid to form complete proteins, that they were all in sprouts in a highly bioavailable format. And then the third one, I was in disbelief. Like I got the information and then I couldn't believe it. And it took me about a month to validate it was that sprouts were medicine and that you could treat chronic and acute illnesses with consumption of sprouts. And I'm talking about autism, Alzheimer's, diabetes, obesity, um, you know, detoxifying benzene from the lungs with sprouts. Like all of a sudden, these nutritional powerhouses were like the stem cells, the original energy of nutrition. And they've been around since the beginning of time. I do. I, I, I want to get to uh, sprouts right now, but I want to ask you just one quick question before that. Um, should kids be vegan or vegetarian? I, I mean, I know you're not a nutritionist and you're not going to recommend anybody do or don't do it, but from just your experience and like being in it so long, how, what are your thoughts on that? 100% in many developed countries, including the United States, the whole food plant-based vegan diet is approved for all stages of life, all from pregnancy to postpartum to infants to all levels, you could be vegan. And it's just what I think you have to set the supplement B12 is the only thing that you have to maybe you watch. Could, you could stop that that's correct. Okay. Cool. Well, moving to sprouts because it's by the way, I just want to I just want to make a note. Sure. The people who think that they're eating meat and they're getting B12, the, the meat that they're eating is the 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 feedlot is being fortified and supplemented with B12. So they're not getting the B12 from meat anyway. It's being supplemented. Yeah, I I heard that. So yeah, that's that's factual. So uh yes. Would you like to see the world kind of vegan to move away from meat? I mean, I know you, I know I think I've heard, saw you in another interview you in the past kind of 
wanted to kind of tell people how to eat a little more. And now since then, you're like, I'm not doing that because that's like a, a minefield. Uh, do you, how do you want to see that kind of nutrition for the world moving forward? Where would you kind of want to nudge it? Well, look, I believe that people are smart. And that if you give them the information, they'll make the right decisions. And, you know, that's where for me, I think that if people are eating more sprouts, more vegetables, um, they're going to feel better and they're going to eat more. So no one, you know, probably including you, wants to be told what to do, mm -hmm. right? So I, I don't want to tell someone what to do. I want to invite them into the possibility of living their best life, of having the most energy, of having the least amount of chronic and acute illnesses. And, you know, I'm happy to um, be out there and share what I do, what works for me. But if you ask me on an intellectual basis, you know, can everybody be vegan? In one way, shape, or form, with work, with adjustments, because there are food sensitivities, there are food allergies, there are other, other requirements. So you can't just tell everyone to eat the same thing because we're all different. Mm -hmm. But I think the source of all nutrition begins with plants. And that if you stay focused on it and you have an earnest desire, you can thrive on that. And I, I know you're an optimistic guy, but do you see it actually happening or no? In my lifetime? Yeah. I mean, look, I know that when I wrote the Sprout book, I couldn't even get a publisher, right? I mean, it was really hard because there was basically no market for sprouting you know, beyond the hippy dippy trippies, you know, and some Asian cuisine. But I went to one of the largest publishers in the world and I did my work and I made recipes made with sprouts. I grew different sprouts. I had a beautiful presentation. I had a one-on-one -on -one meeting and the publisher, no joke, was literally eating the sprouts out of the palm of my <laughs> And fast forward, um, the Sprout book became the number one bestseller book on Amazon for vegetarian cooking, vegan cooking, low budget cooking. That's awesome. And so, so now with tens of thousands of copies in print and a social following, you know, of hundreds of thousands of people, millions of downloads of podcasts I've be, been on. I, I think my last track was. I've received over 10,000 images on social media of other people sprouting wow. who had never sprouted before. So I'm seeing a, a small base double and double and double. Where that goes, nobody knows. But what I could tell you is the people that are sprouting are very happy that they are. They love it and, and they're proud of it. And the ability to take some seeds and soak them and turn a seed into a vegetable literally in front of your eyes in days and share that with your family and your friends is, is heroic. And I think that's why uh, this phenomenon is happening. And if you go back, where did sprouts come from? There would be no life on this planet as we know it if there weren't seeds that germinated, that sprouted, that grew into vegetables, that grew into um, fruit trees and the like. So it all begins with the seed. I've had sprouts before. I buy them because, and I'll tell you why, and you can tell me how I'm wrong. I've been getting broccoli sprouts um, from Whole Foods and I make like a raw drink for myself. I started doing this like a couple of years ago. I get every disgusting raw vegetable in the world and I blend it all up and then I drink it in the morning and the evening. Um, but I've stayed away from using, doing my own sprouts because I don't know where I heard this along the line but that somehow they would go bad if you don't do it right and they could mold or, or, or if you leave them in the water too long. And it like scared me away from, oh, I'm not going to do it right. I'm going to screw it up. So getting into sprouts, how easy is it? I think it's so easy. I think that without advocacy, right? Anything that you do in your life has been marketed to you, pounded, pounded, pounded into your brain. So no one really wants you to sprout. No one cares if you sprout. And, you know, you have one um, fast food chain that contaminates um, sprouts 
and and a few people get sick 20 years ago and the the headlines are sprouts aren't and having a, a data scientist on my team having a nutritional biochemist on my team having a phd plant pathologist on my team analyzing the details of food safety sprouts are as safe as any other food that you're going to eat. Okay. So they're as safe. And there's virtually no instances of reported hospitalizations or deaths from home sprouting. Not the perception I got for sure. And probably what you're talking about is probably some some uh, fast food restaurant. Somebody did something and it was bad. And so everybody's got like a little fear headline and nobody wants to do it. But I could tell you that um, I've got medical doctors. I did a Instagram live with Dr. B who wrote fiber fueled, right? I have his new cookbook here. I'll give him a plug. Nice. Um, right. And his wife was eating broccoli sprouts while she was pregnant and developed in utero flavor development. And then the, the first solid food, the baby ate was broccoli. sprouts. <laughs> it's going to be one healthy baby. Yeah. <laughs> so are they, how long, I mean, uh, and again, people get the book and it'll be all in there. But how long typically are you looking from seed to actually eat, shoving those sprouts in your mouth? Certain certain varieties like lentils or green peas or garbanzo beans, you could soak them, germinate and eat them in 36 hours. Oh, it's quick. Right. And other things like radish, clover, broccoli, you know, those take five days, seven days. Okay. The good thing to know is that the seeds themselves are edible. What happens is when you germinate the seed, you double, you can double the antioxidant levels, you can triple the vitamin C, and you can quadruple the soluble and insoluble fiber. So there's a whole level of like what happens, you know, with the, the process of, of sprouting um, to maximize nutrition. But it's it's basically sprouts or vegetables. And what would be the most effective? What would be your like your order if you went down a list of like your top ones for fighting disease? Are they different than the ones like you were talking about that would maybe repair the body or detoxify the body? Or are these things all kind of exhibiting the same uh, effects on the the human body? The most researched sprouts to date are broccoli sprouts, and there's been thousands of published white papers and studies by major academic. Um, institutions over decades, right? Most of the other sprouts are not researched, right? If you look at them, they're basically fiber, um, water, phytonutrients, and they're alive. So, I mean, there's something to be said with eating things that are fresh, that are growing, that are enzymatically rich versus eating things that are highly processed, denatured, pasteurized, sterilized, et cetera. So, you know, you talk about paleo, you talk about these other, you know, diets, you know, eating sprouts, you know, can be traced back to the beginning of time. Do you recommend how much per day is there? Any, can you get too much? Can they mess up your stomach? You know, I know people are, everybody's different. Um, can I just breakfast, lunch, and dinner? And are you getting enough calories? I mean, do you have to have other things in there to kind of help you fuel your body throughout the day? Well, you know, you being on the Doomsday podcast here, right? You totally, right? If you supplement your B12, you 100% can live on sprouts. Really? Yeah. 100% sprout based diet. You have to adjust the microbiome, the intestinal flora. Mm -hmm. You have to learn how to eat, how to chew. You have to learn the recipes, but you certainly can get the calories from sprouts. And you certainly can get the micronutrients and the macronutrients. So, of course. I've seen you use those jars on a couple of shows and you brought them in, you had like a little a top on them and stuff. Is that something that you've kind of customized yourself or are those things that you can get? I mean, what makes it, the, what is the easiest way to sprout? I mean, do you have to have it like in a dish, in a pan, like in a little le level of water at the bottom? I, I mean, look, on my TikTok, Sprout Wiz, or on my Instagram, Doug Evans, I've posted, you know, a lot of videos, a lot of content on how to do it. But fundamentally, what I love most about sprouts and sprouting is how simple it is. You could start with a clean vessel, 
glass or plastic. And then you can use the screen, whether it's plastic, stainless steel, cheesecloth, you know, a, a, a sock, right? And basically, you just, the seeds are programmed in nature to germinate. And what you want to do is create the environment for their germination. So that soaking period is a level where you remove the enzyme inhibitors, the water permeates the testa and activates the metabolism of the seed to transform itself into a sprout. And what makes the broccoli sprout so potent? Is it what's the what's that chemical in there or the sulforaphane? Oh, that's right. That's right. So ba- basically, it's well known that cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, um, cauliflower, bok choy, kale, um, have um, anti-cancer compounds in them. Turns out they fit into a scientific category called isothiocyanates or glucosinolates. And the main primary glucosinolate is glucoraphanin. And there's also an enzyme that's paired with the glucoraphanin called myrosinase. When you bite and chew or juice or blend, you break open these little vacuoles and the the two um, compounds and the um, enzyme mix and they form sulforaphane, which is very fast acting and it's part of the plant's defense mechanism. So what's defending the plant is helping the human body defend itself against um, the toxins and bad cells and other diseases. And now I heard a while ago, I think it was Rhonda Patrick was on a podcast. It was, and she's huge in the broccoli sprouts and had mentioned, and I don't know if it's true, if they've done follow-up studies that mustard was helped the bioavailability of the sulforaphane in the, I I don't, is that any truth to that? Or do you have to, because I know this, it's so complicated with nutrition and what you're eating and it's being absorbed or not. I think that there's a lot of things that you can do to fine tune them by adding mustard the same way you add pepper to curcumin um, to activate um, the compounds within the turmeric. But the reality is um, what people need to have is more fiber, more fresh vegetables. Like people, you know, are wondering like, where am I getting my protein from? And the fact is, Very few people in the United States are protein deficient, but 95% of Americans are fiber deficient. That makes, yeah, that that doesn't surprise me. (laughs) Now, to get a little controversial, because it's the dad's doomsday guide, and based off my own experience with um, my dad having cancer, um, I got really upset and down about because you always heard growing uh, growing up in in little corners of the of society how it's the cancer industry is rigged toward profit. Uh, there's a cure out there, and they just don't want you to know. They want you to be sick. They want you to be reliant on drugs, and this kind of gets us into the medical community at large and about eating healthy and you know all that stuff and keep you away from it. Um, I'll kind of tell you how I feel about it, and then you can kind of chime in how you feel about it. Um, I feel like watching what my dad went through that there's no like evil person sitting there going, Oh, I have the cure for cancer and no one can have it. And you have to stick with my drugs, but I do feel like it's profit driven and there's no incentive to look in areas that would possibly cure or severely minimize the rates of cancer, unless it's kind of focused on a drug where somebody can make a bunch of money. And this was kind of case in point with my father. I mentioned numerous things to him um, from diet to off-label drugs to all these other things. And it was always a circle back to the chemo in his office that he wanted to do um, and didn't know really anything about it and kind of distorted what I was talking about. And it was, I wasn't coming from a place of crazy conspiracy or blame or anything. I just wanted other ways, even an alternate method of chemo that was kind of a low dose and like more gentle on his body, even that they were dismissive of. I was got really upset about it. Um, do you feel there's a profit problem within that industry? Do you feel? there's a lot of answers in nutrition that are being overlooked because of that mindset. I think that profit is definitely a driver. 
you know, of pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. You look at to the extent of which they advertise, right? And then, but you also look at the um, asymmetry of information between a doctor and a patient. And you look at how little time they have to spend with the patient, mm -hmm. right? So what they're doing is they want to, with their best tools available, the doctor wants, you know, the the patient to get better. And mm -hmm. in that system, in that matrix, you know, there's approved protocols. If someone has X, you know, they can do Y or Z. And these are the environments that th that they're in. And I think what happens is if you're in that system, you know, they they have a solution for you, which is going to be aggressive. And, you know, I, I don't know that much about cancer. My As I mentioned, my mother died of cancer. I also know a lot of people, you know, are dying from chemotherapy, mm -hmm. right? If you think about the major treatments, you know, for cancer, radiation and chemotherapy are both poisonous. Right, they're both poisonous. They're very hard on the body, mm -hmm. and most people don't want to don't want to change. So that's where it's really important for for you to do this preventive stuff at a deep level, so you don't get to the point, you know, where you're, you know, you have a gun against your head and you have to make a decision where, like, it, it's almost like impossible for a patient to sit in a doctor's chair while they've been diagnosed with stage three or stage four cancer and the doctor makes a recommendation and then not listen to the doctor. Like that's just what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is not get there. You want to avoid that situation like the plague, like not go there. So you don't have to be in that circumstance, you know, to have to make that decision. Exactly. Yeah, exactly how I feel. Um, do you, so do you feel like there's no, it's, it sounds bad to say it this way, any cures out there or anything that is being purposefully overlooked, right? Right. The, the, the narrative is we want to keep you alive, but on our drugs. Well, I mean, if you look at, um, you know, I don't know if you, you watched it. My wife watched, um, binge watched dope sick on Hulu. No, I haven't seen that right she binge watched it and you look at what happened with the 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 sackler family you know that owned um the the patents and the company producing um oxycontin mm -hmm. and you look at how many overdoses today are happening with fentanyl right this is tragic this is tragic and you know my brothers one of my brother's closest friends committed suicide when he could no longer get his prescription to to OxyContin. So they kept, you know, increasing his dosage, increasing his dosage, and then they pulled back and he committed suicide. Terrible. And and, and this is a guy I knew. We we grew up, you know, we grew up together in the same place. I knew him. He wasn't my friend, but you know, I knew him. And so I, I think what happens is that it's really incumbent not to say these people are bad. They, they clearly are trying to sell something, right? No one advertises that much on TV, you know, um, to sell stuff. And I, I wouldn't look at the USDA and the FDA to be protecting us, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. uh, again, that's where I went back to the first thing we talked about. The enemy is within. Like we need to get ourselves in check. And what I could tell you is I don't like to run. I don't like to do push-ups, pull-ups, sit-ups, squats. I hate them. But I know that if I don't do them, you know, I'm going to get, I'm going to become overweight. I'm going to become obese. I'm going to get a chronic illness and I'm going to die an early death. So I do those things. And it's the same way, like, I'm sure you've heard me say, it. I believe everything you put in your mouth is in fact a life or death decision and that um, you need to take control of it. You need to make wise decisions or you're putting your whole, you know, health, family um, at risk.
Yeah, uh, I completely agree. I don't know. Have you seen the uh, that documentary Food Inc? It was out a while ago. Did you ever yeah. watch that? Yeah, I like that movie. Yeah, it, it was excellent. And I, I, I just remember them talking about corn and soy subsidies and the government. And then they were talking about the FDA uh, or pe- people who used to be in the FDA were on the, these boards. And it was just like, it's, it seemed yeah, like the such revolving, a- The revolving door of bureaucratic bullshit. So whether it's the food industry or the pharmaceutical industry, it's a revolving door. And, you know, that's where you got to just take control. And that's where, you know, to, to me, I recommend sprouts and sprouting because it's something that everyone can do on their own. And it's simple and it's life changing. Why, why are they subsidizing like soy and corn and you can go into a store and buy a liter of soda for like, you know, it used to be like 99 cents now with prices, it's probably more. But then I go and buy organic broccoli and I'm paying like $10 for a few crowns, like what is, what is that process and why the hell is it that way? I mean, it's the farm bill and it's lobbying. And, you know, even during COVID, you know, the Biden administration gave a billion dollars to farmers, you know, to support them and, you know, doing meat. Like, so this is just, you know, the system is rigged, you know, to support these. And it's not like they're supporting individual farmers. These are big industrial complexes, profit machines that that they're just supporting. And so, you know, if you think about all the lobbying, all the bills, everything that government and the Senate and the House how have to think about, like th- this is just rigged. Like no one, it's good, it's really hard to break through that. You know, especially you had, you know, Trump giving um you know, fast food to professional athletes and, you know, in the white house, (laughs) you know, like, you know, we, we live in a society that's just, you know, bizarre. And you you talk about rigged. Why is it just because the meat industry, the sugar, the corn, all that stuff is creating foods that are much more profitable. So it's better for the farmers. And so they want to push that through and that not everybody's going to want, even if broccoli was cheap, you're not going to have it flying off the shelves, like a bag of chips or sugary cereal or whatever else it is. Well, unless, like I said, unless you add the salt, oil, sugar, you know, to the the broccoli, it's not going to taste, you know, appealing. Mm-hmm. It's almost like what's happening with pornography in this country. You have sixteen year old um, kids that have been, you know, males that have been so addicted to pornography that all of a sudden they 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 can't have a normal relationship with a woman or or man or woman because they're expecting this delusional perspective you know, to happen because everything is sensationalized. Do you, for GMOs, because I was th- talking about food ink and made me think of, was it Monsanto, the company and like the GMOs and like all that huge mess that was explained in that documentary. Um, what's the argument about GMOs? For, for me, I've always heard like, oh, they're bad. You don't want to eat it. You don't know what's in it or you don't know how it's done. Like what is the actual argument that it could be harmful to your body? Like what would it be doing? So here's the thing. There's not a lot of research that fundamentally says a genetically modified food is bad for you. Okay. Problem with Monsanto and glyphosate and Roundup is that when you're using a genetically modified seed, you then can be resistant to certain pesticides. So the seed will grow and the weeds won't grow. So they will in a very unregulated, massive amount, spray the crap out of the crop. And the crop is very saleable and very erect and happy. But the land, the soil, everything else has been heavily sprayed. So the research on the GMOs is still um, out there, right? They still don't have that. The research on glyphosate poisoning and pesticide point poisoning um is very clear like you know i don't even know how many tens of billions of dollars have been awarded in fines because of the link between this pesticide use and um and cancers so so basically you know the, the, it's it's a very complicated intertwined system that we're dealing with And, you know, the simplest thing to me is eating sprouts and eating local and eating organic um, and eating plants, because then 
you're you're protecting yourself from all of this other things. And if you think about how many pounds of this glyphosate sprayed crop that that animal is eating and that are accumulating inside of their tissue, and then you're eating that, and no one is doing the research to say how bad that is for you, because what is most of the industry funded research for? To get approval to sell more stuff. Yeah. The the asymmetry is all the money's going to this, and there's a few people that are this, you know. So that's where, you know, I'm my my stuff is grassroots. Like I don't want to tell people don't eat meat. I don't want to become the enemy of people. Mm-hmm. I want to tell them, hey, sprouts are really nutritious. You can grow them without soil, without sunshine, without fertilizer in days, not weeks, months, or years. And you're getting food, you're getting vitamins, and you're getting medicine. And it's fr- it's practically free. You could eat on a few dollars a day of sprouts. And you can do them with simple tools like like a jar and some seeds and a screen or a colander or uh, unbleached paper towels. I mean, there's a chapter in my book called Junkyard Dog, because I took all of these things from the recycle bin, from my cabinets, et cetera. I sterilized them, you know, and I use them as sprouting implements. How do you get someone motivated to eat better if they're not scared to eat better? Like you saw kind of some horrific stuff around your family. I saw my dad. I mean, all these things are constantly on my mind to eat better. Do you think, does everybody need to get scared into that to really make a change into this? I had a friend who called me and said, Doug, I don't care about the environment, right? I don't really care about my health, but like I, someone told me, one of my performance coaches, et cetera, told me that I could get harder erections <laughs> by being plant-based. That did and, and I said, well, did that work? He's like, unbelievable. He's <laughs> like, I've got an iron rod right now I feel like a tantric master. And he goes, I'm never eating meat again because I love the feeling of that hard erection. Feels so good. I can control it. Every wave of pleasure. I am now eating for a different kind of pleasure. (laughs) That's all I guess. Everybody everybody will find a different reason than I guess, right? Once they start down that path. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Do you think sugar or meat is more detrimental to your health. And I know you have reasons for believing both are, but what do you think is more? Because I almost have come to view sugar as like a drug. Refined, there's a so, totally difference like between naturally occurring glucose and fructose that exist in plants and fruit. And so many people have demonized fruit. Like mm-hmm. I was just texting a friend of mine who's a diabetic and he's like, oh, I can't eat fruit, you know, too much sugar. And I was like, no, the fruit has glucose and fructose. The the sugar that's bad is refined sugar from high fructose corn syrup and beet and cane. Those are the sugars that are bad. Added sugar, refined sugars, naturally occurring sugars in plants are good. Do you feel like the ratio of plant of uh, like plant sugar to or um, vegetables to fruit should be a certain? No, no. You... I I think that if if you're eating raw fruit and you're not eating high fat, like high carb in the form of raw fruits and vegetables, is perfectly acceptable. Okay, so it's the combination. Yeah, I think. Be... Yeah. I mean, there's a great book I encourage everyone to read called Mastering Diabetes. And they go in deep into it. And we have a diabetic crisis with 34 million people having diabetes in the United States and 98 million people being pre-diabetic and 66 million of the 98 million don't even know that they're pre-diabetic. Do you fast? I mean, I know it sounded like you kind of were intermittent fasting a little bit. I do you- intermittent fasting. I do water fasting and I do dry fasting. I really love fasting. How many days do you ever do a water fast? I've done seven days and 10 days. Okay. I've done up to five. And that's at five, I was like, I mean, I felt like, man, I feel pretty weak. I, I need to start eating again. Do you have any tips about how, do you add anything? I know some people add a little bit of so- no, stuff. I think when I do the water fast, the most important thing is the set and setting that you need okay. to be in a place where you can relax, 
not get distractions, you know, not get the temptations. You got to real like for me, you know, my fast and my water fasting is best in nature. Okay. And then lastly, because I noticed you're, I mean, kind of an entrepreneur, you've started businesses, you've taken a lot of risk. Some stuff has paid off, some stuff haven't. How do you approach life in that sense? I know from a nutritional, like a foundational level to feel good, to actually take on the challenges of a day. But do you have any tips to leave anybody with in terms of, you know, failure, not being afraid of this stuff, even changing your diet? Do you have anything kind of to help people along that path? Yeah. I mean, I think that you have to take risks, right? Like ships, you know, are, are safe at shore, but that's not what they were made for. Right. And I don't think we were made, you know, to live a conservative, you know, placid life. Mm. Right. That that I, I I encourage people to take risks. And basically, to me, there is no real failure. You know, there are mistakes. And if you can identify the mistake, I view that as a success. So I like get knocked down, I get back up, I get knocked down. And to me, I just encourage people, if you have a dream go for it. Like go for it because you're not going to be happy if you don't go for it. Mm -hmm. So, but it has to be something that's real. And typically, you know, the things that I've pursued have been much more about mission based than have been about money. Like I like to pursue a mission and for the mission, you know, I'll, I'll go to great lengths for it for things for money. Like I can't really be motivated for money. I'm not bri- I can't be bribed or manipulated. If anything, you know, if there was any like misinformation about my career was that they people thought like I was doing things for the money. Right? Cuz there was big money involved. You want to do a big project, there's going to be big money involved. But to me, that was far, you know, incidental to the fact of the mission. And my mission on a macro level is that the U.S. dietary guidelines recommend seven to thirteen servings of fruits and vegetables, and the average American is consuming less than one. So, and that goes back to that ninety-five percent fiber deficiency. So, so that's my mission. And sometimes I talk to a wall. You know, sometimes people get angry. You know, like I have friends who will only eat in vegan restaurants. I'll eat in any restaurant if they will serve me food that meets my criteria. But what I don't want to do is alienate all these other people when I have an opportunity to get my message across to them. So I'm constantly looking for opportunities to have intelligent dialogues that are not dogmatic, that are fact-based, principle-based, scientifically based, um, and and help people. Awesome. And if people want to know more about you or follow you, I know you got a really great following. Where can they find you? Are you in Instagram and whatnot? I'm on Instagram, Doug Evans on Instagram. I'm on TikTok at Sprout Wiz, W-I-Z. And you could sign up for my Sprout-based newsletter at thesproutbook.com. Awesome, sir. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Hey, my pleasure, Scott. You're, you're taking initiative. You're out there and you're doing great things and happy to support you and your audience.